That's also part of the partnership. Like your partner doesn't get to know who you are in e if you don't show up in all of the spaces, including the hard ones and say, no, this is actually who I am. And that's the whole point of intimacy of being together is that we get to be known. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from all over the world to hear their personal journeys of self-discovery through the lenses of love, sex, and relationships. Our mission is to show people that they're not alone and to inspire them to embrace their true selves so that together we can open minds and live authentically without shame. We believe everyone's story is powerful and beautiful, yet it's important to remember that everyone does life a little bit differently and that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we aren't doctors. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to the first episode of Ask Us Anything. This is Misha and Finn, and we are answering community questions together. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited as well. And we 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 had to we had to hand the baton. Emma always introduces our episodes, and and I thought it would be perfect to to hand that off to you as well, Misha. So I'm pretty big shoes to fill. I'm excited though. Yes, she wears a size nine. um, So. Same size as I wear. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm I'm super excited to be here and to answer questions from. Yeah, th- these first couple happen to be from within our our community, but yeah, anybody out there listening can send us Absolutely. a question, and um, we'll we'll tell you more about how to do that in a minute. But um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and to dig in. We've got three amazing questions today, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and. There were some yeah. good ones too. We had to think about them. So I'm excited about the feedback and, and the, the thought process that went into the questions they gave us. Yeah, totally. So maybe that's a great place to say, like, if you do have feedback for us on like questions, or if you have a question that you want to submit, there is a tab on our website at normalizingnonmonogamy.com where you click on the podcast tab. And then there's a, a drop down and it'll say, ask us anything. And on there, it'll tell you a little bit more about how to send a question. And when you do, it'll, it'll ask you to create an account. It's free. You have to put in like your name and email. We will never share any of that information. It never leaves us and we will never divulge it on the show, but that's how you record a message or send us feedback. And we would love to hear from you. Awesome. First up, maybe a little bit of background on who Miche is and a little bit more about who I am and what makes us at least somewhat qualified to talk about the stuff we're about to talk about today. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Go for it, Miche. Okay. Um, I am a coach. I come into this particular space as a coach working with people who uh, live and breathe in the spaces of ethical non-monogamy. I am also a fully licensed therapist, marriage and family therapist, but I don't necessarily come from that space. It is a really great tool to have in my tool belt, though. And um, the coaching practice that I work with is Expansive Connection. A lot of you have heard of Catherine, and she does amazing work on a lot of different podcasts around e and And um, she asked me to join in on her coaching practice, and I have been so excited to be there. And through that, that's how I met you all, um, met uh, Finn and Emma, and have been asked to come on and do some of the community questions. And so I'm excited about that. I do have a specialty in sex therapy and um, trauma therapy, and so I get to use those tools as well, but most of the time, I'm just trying to help people get closer in the relationships and get to the sexy. Yeah, I love it, and and, and maybe from a personal standpoint, what is your high-level relationship to non-monogamy and, and this whole world? Yeah, so I think I've always been a little E and M just in my thought process around relationship structure. I did a lot of like delving into that from a like a women centric uh, perspective in college, and just kind of have kept that and continued continue to grow in my own like thought process and research around it, and then started to like ask questions of myself and the greater world. And uh, with my partner, we kind of had a a lot of questions about that and was like, do you, do you want to do this? And we're like, yeah, let's do it. So we kind of ventured into that space around 2019 and kind of kept going. And it's been a really amazing journey, learning about myself, learning about others, 
unlearning some things I didn't want to have in my life anyway, and uh, and going from there. So that's been my own particular journey, and it continues to grow and change. And I don't, I'm more like if I have to put it in a box, I'm more like in the polysphere. But I think like it's a continuum, and it just kind of goes up and down on that journey, like depending on who I'm with and where I am personally. Yeah, I love that. I love it. Well, thank you, and I'm excited to do this with you. Yeah. And my, sort of my, again, people probably know a bit more about me, but just a high level for anybody who's landing here for the first time. Yeah, Emma and I opened our partnership up when we were about a year or so into it. We were like 19 and 20 at that point. And we kind of dabbled in it. We were in college, being college kids. But then we we graduated, got a little bit more into it around 20. 10, 2011. So for the last, let's call it 10 to 13 years, we've been we've been exploring some version of non-monogamy. For a long time, that looked like uh, more of the traditional swinging. We were always trying to find like this like mythical friends with benefits that everybody talks about, or or people that we could just be ourselves, go camping and do fun life stuff with but you know what if if the conversation got sexy or we wanted to share something a little more intimate about ourselves that that wasn't that that wasn't taboo and so we've we've been looking for that for a very long time and had a lot of experiences and then over the last few years we found ourselves a bit more into the polyamory side of things we've been exploring a polyamorous quad and all of the the things that that brings into our life that we had to then unpack, um, even with being open for 15 years, unpacking codependencies and personal childhood traumas and <laughs> traumas that we've inflicted upon each other. And so we've we've been doing we've been doing all of the work. And uh, myself, I've spent the last um, last fall into the spring. I did the first half of a sex and relationship coaching program through the somatic institute so i'm about halfway done with that i've also just started the advanced training for that program that'll be done sometime in the early summer and so i'm i'm on a path to better learn myself and better able to show up and support and answer you know these types of questions but i do have a ton of experiential <laughs> knowledge and having talked to like over 500 people about this so I think, I think we're going to be okay. Yeah. I think you put in the man hours. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, should we, should we do, just do it? Jump into the first question. Just jump in. I'm excited. Yeah. Let's hear some questions. Hey, so I actually have a question around determining or finding, I'm not sure on the right word, but I guess so we'll use determining. Determining the difference between a boundary and an opportunity for growth um, with a little bit of context um, and what prompted the question, um, even though the question is meant, meant to be a bit more general, the, the topic is um, interaction with a metamor, I guess we'll say in this case. My husband is dating someone and it's moving along and they've started uh, staying nights together, uh, two nights a week. And my husband is, has asked that uh, we also have one day or event a week where all three of us get together in an effort to kind of, you know, get to know each other, connect and whatnot. Um, and I've done that several times um, and it's enjoyable. However, the last two times, um, it's been fairly rough for me, and I have <laughs> I have ended up crying in the shower uh, trying to figure out my life <laughs> uh, the past two times. Um, and we've certainly worked through it and everything like that and had good conversation, but I struggle with my limits versus my expectation for growth. Um, so specific example, um, but general question as best as possible. And thank you guys so much for, uh, for everything that you do. That's such a good question. I loved it. Yeah. I, I, I love this question as well. It's a, it's a juicy one and boundaries, one. boundaries are always like such a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just as a reminder, boundaries are the things we do for ourselves. Boundaries are not things we put upon other people there for us. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the fact that he made a distinction between boundaries, limits, and expectations because those are kind of different things. Yeah. What, what, um, what came up for me too is just the idea that I think sometimes we don't, we don't necessarily know our limits 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're often the ones to cross our own boundaries as, yeah. as we seek towards that. And they're such an imperfect science. Like boundaries can be such an imperfect sort of science to them that you, I, I mean, I'm testing mine all the time. What are, where can I go? How far can I go? Oh, I went too far. What do I need to do in the future? And so I just, just to maybe just to celebrate and honor that process that, that he sort of explained so relatable. Yeah. Thank you so much for being brave and like sharing this question with us, with us. Sometimes it's like, Oh, I, I want to have the question. I want to ask it, but maybe I don't think it's big enough or maybe it's too big or it's too nuanced. So thanks for even like giving us the question. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first thing I thought about when I heard this was like, like fear and sadness. Like those were the two emotions that kind of came up to me a little bit when I, when I heard his question, because it sounds like in the beginning he was like, Oh, maybe I can, um, I can stretch myself here. And then as he continued to stretch, the feeling was, this is overwhelming. This is too much. And then what is the fear that maybe we're not talking about in this space? And then also how are we expressing the sadness in a way that your partner can hear and that you can honor at the same time? So those were the, those were the emotional things that came up. And I think when you get to the part where, cause I think we've all been there. I have definitely been there where you're crying in the shower. Like what on earth did I do? Did I agree to this? Did I sign on for this pain? Like, like what was I thinking? I have definitely like been driving in my car. I've been like, like just just like, who the hell do you think you are <laughs> to even do all this? Why are we doing this? We, I need an ice cream. So like the idea that <laughs> like you could backpedal majorly from this, like, let's just take that as an option. I can backpedal. And that's normally where you're like, oh, that's a limit. That was too much. That was overwhelming. And that was hard. And it's okay to have limits. Yeah. I, I love that. That Uh, that idea that it is okay to have limits. And I think it plays really well into a thought that came up for me around this, which is the, the idea that there's a right way to do Mm -hmm. this, that, Oh, Mm -hmm. well, my partner is seeing somebody, this is supposed to look a certain way. And it sounds like somewhere in there, the idea that it has to be what quote unquote kitchen table poly, where, you know, everybody can sit around the kitchen table and, you know, have a wonderful time. We can, we can eat dinner together, go off to our bedrooms, wake Mm -hmm. up together, have breakfast Mm -hmm. together, and it'll be perfect. That's the, that's the only acceptable form of non-monogamy. And, and I, that could be something great to strive for. Maybe. Oh, that was definitely, doesn't everybody have like E&M dreams like these, well, you get into it and you have like these, like, like halo moments where you're like in my perfect world, this would be beautiful. And I definitely was like, let's buy a farm. Yeah, with everybody out there like five months into this and I was like I want my own room no one's coming over I like my space you're allowed to like change it like I I think it looks different for everybody and I think once you don't recognize what kind of poly what kind of E&M relationship or lifestyle situation that you want until you've actually played around in it a little bit and and maybe one for me one of the more if, if it's like to, to lean into the disappointment side of it the what I want and what I'm capable of don't always align. And so do I want that farm? Yeah, that sounds amazing. But it sounds like it sounds like this listener would need to build a separate shower for crying into if that's what they need, right? Because this mm-hmm. is hard and there's nothing wrong with that. And probably for most of us, as we do these things, we find ways to cope in different ways. But yeah, I... Th- you and I were talking before we hit record and like the sort of an analogy that comes up for me is if, if your dream is to run, uh, Ironman, right. You want to be an Ironman competitor, Mm -hmm. but you break your ankle and you're like, well, the goal is to be an Ironman competitor. So I have to get out there. I got to get on my bike. I got to get in the water. I got to start running. And the whole time your ankle is broken, like you're probably never going to get to run that Ironman because you're just going to keep re-injuring your ankle. And so if you can find ways with your partner or partners to say, okay, I still want the dream, but I need to reassess what I'm capable of right now. Absolutely. And and you know what? Maybe in that healing process, you go, I don't ever want to run an Ironman. That was a great thing that I thought <laughs> would be cool, but maybe I don't. Maybe I'm more of like a sprint triathlon person and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I need to do it once every six months. So I think being able to adapt and say, yeah, I would still love to have lunch with your partner 
but I think I need to do it like once a month or Mm -hmm. it needs Mm -hmm. to just be lunch and not a whole day or I can build up to it. I don't know, but I know I crossed myself and now I got to reset and figure out where I can start from and how we do that without you feeling like you have to give up who you are. And I think that's also like a hard thing because sometimes you feel like, man, I've already agreed to this. Mm -hmm. I feel like a really bad person for like bad backpedaling and being like, actually, you know, that thing I agreed to, I don't actually want to do it. And I know how excited you were about it. So it's like that disappointing your partner and maybe a little bit of self-disappointment that you didn't reach as far as you thought you could have. So like nobody wants to be the, like the quote unquote, like wet blanket that has to like put the brakes on things when you see how happy your partner is, I'm just, I'm assuming they're happy. I I don't actually know. I'm assuming Mm -hmm. that they're like happy to be with the other person. And that's also part of the partnership. Like your partner doesn't get to know who you are in E&M. If you don't show up in all of the spaces, including the hard ones and say, no, this is actually who I am. And that's the whole point of intimacy of being together is that we get to be known. Yeah. And then, then you get to work together towards a, a common goal that you can write. So if it say, I still want you to spend those two nights a week with your partner. I don't want to stop that. And in order to support that, I can't do lunch every week, perhaps. Right. Or I can't do lunch every week right now. Um, so it's, how do we, yeah. How do we do that dance of trying something, being okay, coming back out of it, trying something new, be like that. That is a really delicate dance. I love that you said support. I think that's such a great way of like couching it in language. It's not like I don't want to, or I'm pulling away from, or I'm not, I'm, I, it's not that I don't want to be on, on board. I actually want to support you. I want to show up and be there for you. How do I do that with you, for you, for us, and also honor myself? Yeah. I feel, I feel, I feel pretty good about that. How do you, how are you feeling about the completeness of this answer? I don't know. I think I want to talk a little bit more about expectations. Let's do it. Okay. So when we talk about like our expectations, do we also sometimes think about like our, like our partners perceive expectations? Like I'm expecting my partner to, I want my partner to have this vision of like who I could be and Polly and I'm worried or E&M and I'm worried about letting them down. Even like the metamors, like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get worried that the metamor won't see me um, the way that I would like to be portrayed. I don't want people to be like, oh, that's that crazy metamor and they won't let me do this. Or every time we we try this new thing, they pull back a little bit instead of recognizing that I'm still trying to find my own footing. So I don't know. Sometimes I have like, um, I think what it's called is like mind reading. It's like Mm -hmm. a negative cognitive cognitive distortion, like mind reading about the other metamor that they're going to perceive me in a negative light kind of. And so sometimes even my push or test of my own boundaries is in service of this expectation or view that they might have of me. And so like, if you're one of those people that's like, I just want everyone to like be happy. And I want to portray this person who would be able to not break down about this, like letting yourself off the the hook about that as well. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, my brain often goes to a place too of if I set a boundary and now my partner is going to go to to their partner and be like, well, I really wanted to, but I can't because of Uh my, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, so like those, those are like, I don't know. To me, I think they're fairly common narratives to have the first time you're doing something like this. And so I think what's interesting is there's a double-edged sword that getting three getting the three people together to have those conversations out in the open yeah. can dispel a lot of those, but Absolutely. they might also be hard um, yes. to do. So yeah, it's a, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that you, I, I like that you brought up that the expectations. And I think um, I had a note here too, around really talking about what is the core thing that you're trying to get at, right? If, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps your partner is more like, well, I don't actually want to have lunch with all three of us, but I'm afraid you'll feel left out. Right. And so now they're trying to solve your problems Um, and you're being like, well, my partner wants to have lunch with all three of us. I don't want them to think I don't want to be there Yeah, and I don't really want to be there, but, um, (laughs) but I should go. And now, now you like, nobody knows that nobody really wants this, but, and I'm not saying that that's what's happening here, but I just really inspect and, 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 
inspecting what is it that you're trying to accomplish Mm -hmm. and how do you accomplish it? Also, like, what are you, what fear are you trying to avoid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of this, sometimes we just do things so that we don't have to encounter the hard or address the fear that we're kind of like subconsciously running from. So what is the fear in this? Um, And can, can that fear be tended to in a different way? And I think that kind of goes back to like the whole like sitting down together and being like talking about like, do we even all really want to be here or do we think we just should? Right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think the last just quick couple of thoughts, the more specifically on the topic of metamors, and this is just a couple of resources for people that I thought would be important. Um, sort of two different episodes that have a two different spins on the relationship with metamors and being able to accept that. And so one is the episode from just a few weeks ago, episode 310 with Anna, Andy, and Jay, and they talk about how Andy and Jay really don't have a whole lot in common, but they do have a partner in common. And so they've done a lot of work to build a part or friendship, a metamor connection to support that. But it was not a natural thing Mm -hmm. and, and they've gotten there and simultaneously back. This was episode 193 with Sony and Gabe. They talk about in there, how they had this vision of, uh, they were doing like monthly lunches or brunches with their whole sort of polycule or one or two of the partners. And, and they tried this for like a handful of months. And finally, I'm pretty sure it was Gabe was just like, this isn't working. Like, nobody's having fun at lunch. What are we doing? And finally they had to be like, look, we can let go of it. Like yeah. we don't, we, we can, I can support you having these relationships, but we don't all have to sit down for a lunch and be uncomfortable. Like that doesn't have to happen. And they yeah. re, redefined how they did it. I and I that. think that was amazing. So I, I just want people to, again, take away that there's not a right way to do it. And it's got to feel really authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Next question. Yeah, let's do it. What advice would y'all give someone who is about to go to their first group sex experience? Let us know. Thanks, guys. Love you. All right. Group sex. We we purposely put this question second so everybody didn't think that all non-monogamy is is about sex and group sex. So That's what everybody thinks. Like you say, like, I am I'm non-monogamous, and immediately they're like orgies everyone's yep. having an orgy I'm like no actually we're not all actually having all that much sex some of us are just having lots of long conversations about boundaries and what do you want and time schedules it's a lot of google documents that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> but every once in a while you get to let yourself out and go to an orgy i suppose <laughs> <laughs> also that <laughs> I, I would I would be curious, Miche, do you or maybe yeah, do you have experience in going into group sex environments and maybe have you had your very first like, oh my god, this is the first time I'm about to do this? So um if you've heard if you've heard me on other podcasts, I think sometimes I've I've talked a little bit about like it's only I've only had one. And I went into a uh LS uh nightclub. And I was in there and I um, was like, it was my first time. So like my eyes were huge. Everything was intense. Like I was overwhelmed and I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing anything group. Like we're just going to walk around, we'll grab some snacks and then we're going to leave. Like that's what we're going to do. Right. And um, there was this guy that walked by and he had like the best shoes. Like they were awesome. They were like loafers that lit up. I was like, what? And so we had this whole conversation and he introduced me to some people and, um, we started talking and he was like, Hey, you guys want to play? And I was like, I mean, yeah, the shoe, you had me at the shoes kind of. And so we went back to play and we didn't talk about, like, he made sure we were comfortable, but we didn't talk about what our limits were, what our boundaries were, nothing. Like we just started playing and I was like, well, I'm cool. And I looked over at my husband and I was like, are you cool? And he was like, yeah, I'm cool. And so we started playing and then like in the middle of it, because I'm such a sensory person, I was like, oh my gosh, this is too sexy. Like I need to breathe. Like I can't breathe. It's just too hot. And so like, I'm like, I'm going to go to the bathroom and I get out and I go to the bathroom. And I guess they all took that as a cue that I wasn't into it. And so by the time I came back, like everybody had gone and I was like, I fumbled that really hard. Um, cause I wanted to come back to a puppy pile, like went back. Um, and I think if I had had like some tools or some ideas of like, how to handle that situation better, I would have 
come back to like a really sexy situation instead of like an empty room. So yeah, that was, that's my story. So, so you have some experience and you have some experience going, well, that wasn't how to do it. And now we have to do it different the next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was sad. It was a sad day. <laughs> I love it. Well, su- suffice it to say, I have some experience. I don't need to go into it all, but there's some experience. I have some yeah. experience in this department. And so, okay. <laughs> so I feel, I feel equipped to talk about this equipped. one as well. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, have you been, have you been dumped from a puppy pile that you didn't realize uh, that you had been dumped from? Just me? But no, no, not just you. I've, okay. I've, I've ended up eating cookies in a kitchen by myself while everybody else had fun. Or I've also been the person who stopped at the bathroom on the way to okay. like, literally I got okay. there like 23 seconds after everybody. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how everything got started that fast. <laughs> so like, I, I, I didn't stop off for a while. I was like seconds behind everybody. And it was like, what the hell did I walk through a time warp? <laughs> So yeah, I've, I've, I've seen all matter of crazy in this world. So, all right. So your advice for somebody going to their first sort of group sex experience. Okay. So I think every experience is a little different, but I kind of have an elevator speech that I like to use in the beginning now. Um, and I think that elevator speech based off of my own personal experience also includes like a pause. So some of the things, and I have a worksheet, Mm -hmm. I'll give it to you to add into your show notes because I think like, I like to think of this as how are we changing the culture? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we change the culture is by showing up in a way that we hope to be reciprocated as time goes on. And so what if, the ways we do that, it's, I call it give and dear. Um, and if you know a little bit about my background, I like dialectical behavior therapy. So it's definitely like a pull from Marshall Linehan's book. Um, and so that'll be in the notes. But basically, it's asking you, what does a pause look like? What does a group check-in look like? What are your boundaries look like? What are your flexible boundaries? What are your hard limits? And then all of that leads to an enthusiastic yes. But that needs to be vocalized before the play session starts. And if you are an overthinker like I am, then what I like to do is to have all of that out in the open because then I get to take off of take off my like overthinking, planning for everything, making sure everybody's happy, over vigilance hat and set it down. And then I get to be like, oh, here's my reptilian brain. Let me sit in this super nice sexy bit and I get to play. Yeah. I, I could not say it better myself. Like I, I, we use a different, uh, there's a handful of different um, mnemonics and strategies for that, for that sort of safer sex Mm -hmm. elevator pitch and setting the boundaries in the container. And we'll link a few of them. There's, there's the stars uh, from Evelyn Dacker and there's also the Reed Mahelko's safer sex elevator pitch. And a lot of these, they pull in those same, same elements. And, and I put down my, my first bullet point, to and to to respond to this was um, ahead of time set the con- set and understand the container that you're going into and um, setting clear boundaries and limits for yourself and and then maybe not maybe but not renegotiating those in the moment right Just having a bit of a an abundance mindset to say like. I can always come back and do more. I can't mm-hmm. ever go forth and undo something I did when I crossed my, yeah. myself. And and we've even, some of, I will say there was a dividing line between good group experiences and the not so good or sometimes the really bad. And that was exactly what you said. And we would have a circle the share circle before the experience started where everybody, and we've had this with up to like 15 people in the share circle say you go around and it's, what are you into? What are you not into? What are your limits? What are, you know, that's a great place to say, I have a latex allergy or I have, you know, what are your STI testing results? Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. are your protocols for safer sex? And, and some that I've actually like added in sort of since our last time doing this is what is, what does maybe even a trauma response look like for you, right? If, if, if you get triggered and you're somebody who gets triggered and goes into sort of like a catatonic checkout state, Mm -hmm. that's a really wonderful time to say, Hey, 
if you see me go into this, Mm -hmm. check in with me like this. And then that gives, like you said, then you can take off the hat of like checking everybody all the time and say, okay, I know how to move in this space with a relatively high degree of confidence and safety that I'm not going to hurt somebody, hurt myself or be hurt. And so I, that was just expanded a little bit on what you said, but like setting that container is to me, like the number one thing. And it allows you to have like levels of expectations as well in that container, right? Like you can say, I'm all up for all of the things. And then someone can say, I just want to do lots of touching. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to do. I don't want to do anything else, but I'm going to do it enthusiastically. (laughs) Like that's what I'm here for. And so then there's no, it takes off a lot of that internal pressure we put in ourselves and then the perceived external pressure. Yeah. No, and it's amazing. And it and it lets that environment then be so much more, I would say, fluid, right? Not not perfect. Yeah. It's not gonna be perfectly fluid, but you now know, right? There is a one of my favorite like anecdotes where this got messed up. And it, I wasn't at this event, but we we've had somebody tell us about it a few times and they they were okay with us sharing this, which is one of the people in there she's she identifies as a lesbian but she is married to a man mm-hmm. and that is that is the man in her life mm-hmm. and she we did they did the share circle and she shared this so she's like I'll play with women and my husband but no other men I am identify as a lesbian mm-hmm. and this other guy he was like out parking the car got to the got to the share circle like minutes too late yeah and he was like you know with with respect you know kind of and showing an interest in her all night. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and she just kept turning me down and turning me down and turning me down. And finally I was like, I'm like, is it like, I just want to tell like, is there something like, I, I, you know, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. She's like, she's like, no, I'm like, I'm a lesbian. And he's uh-huh. like, that would have been really great information to have if I had been in the share circle uh-huh. that like, uh-huh. like, and he had no clue because all he knew was that she was married to a man. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot of information you can get from these about what people are into and not mm-hmm. into. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it doesn't even have to be limiting. I was part yeah. of one of these where a, a person that like stepped into the circle and I was like intimidated to the max. And like the, one of the first things she said was like, also, I just want everybody to know that like, I want to have sex with everybody in this circle. And like, not that it happened, but that she put it out there and she was like, yeah. that's my level of comfort. And then uh-huh. my brain was like, well, it may not happen for you, Finn, but you know you could at least yeah. talk yeah. talk to this person, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Whereas my old self would have said, like, don't even bother, right? Okay. And so uh-huh. it, it opens you up to, like, mm-hmm. new experiences mm-hmm. that aren't just, let's see how we can tamp this down. Like, how can we open it up? Yeah. Oh, and that's such, like, a, a like a nice growth space because then, then you get to start telling yourself a different narrative about people that you probably would have been, like, that's probably going to be a hard pass. I know it's probably something I would say to myself too. Like, we're not even going to go there because it's mm-hmm. probably not. But if they're like, I'm open, I'd be like, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can say something different to myself now. Like, this isn't a no. I like that. Especially if their shoes are just, like their shoes, light their up. shoes are lighting up, right? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. I I think there's another thought that I wanted to add sort of along the lines here and and also to maybe pull in another question that we had that sort of dovetails into this. Uh And that last point is be okay leaving. Um, If if you get to a point where you're like, and that could even be in the share circle where you're like, holy shit, this is more than I ever thought I could do. Uh, I do need to leave. Like, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. do right yeah. you can communicate yeah. it and leave and even if it's clunky the most important thing is that you're taking care of yourself absolutely like being able to say no so i i know that like there's so many people that say you know like when they get into the situation that they're like maybe it's a it's an i don't know it's a maybe it's i could not mm-hmm. like yes let's do this and so they get in and maybe just stretch themselves or they're not quite sure if they even want to. And they get in the situation and then it's a clear no to them in their bodies. Mm-hmm. But then saying that might disrupt the group experience. Um, and so trying to figure out how do I get out of that a little bit can be a little tricky. And so 
piggybacking off of what you said, it's always good to say no. It's always okay to change your mind. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that I like being able to say no in a very gentle way is what I call it a shit sandwich. Other people call it a compliment sandwich, but it feels I like saying it's a shit sandwich. So (laughs) you say like the compliment on one, one part of it. So it's like, Oh my gosh, you were so hot. And then in the middle, it's I, just don't think my head's in the game and I'm going to bow out and thank you so much for you for being interested and wanting to play with me. Cause this is super sexy, right? Like, or the meat could be my body is saying yes, but my head's not here mm-hmm. or vice versa, you know? Um, or you can even just say you're hot. I think I want to take a little bit of a breath cause it's so sexy. I'm overwhelmed and I might come back, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. All of that's good. Yeah. Um, and, and your no is valid. And I'm pretty sure that for most people, if you need to take like a bleacher view of it, the people in the group would much rather you say no and be happy and maybe want to go play somewhere else or come back and play later. than you grit your teeth and muscle through it for the good of the group. Mm-hmm. Well, and oh, I have another thought on that, but I want to play this question because I think it's so perfectly aligned. Um, so you're at a party. I'm at a party. There is a bunch of people. And my thought was that we were going to all be pairing off and going to different beds, maybe having to share a bed, but still paired off where there would be some connection and communication. Um, my partner ends up in one room alone, which is fine with me. And I end up with five others who gravitated to the same bed. This was certainly not my choice, but I wasn't sure how to get out of it at the time. Um, After very impersonal experience with little to no pleasure, um, the event ended and um, people dispersed. I realized from that that I really don't want to do that again. And that's fine. But my question is, how do you get out of it um, diplomatically and like without hurting feelings? I'm not sure Once I was in the situation, if I knew that was what was going to happen and everybody was just ganging up on the same bed, I may have just gone in a different direction and made myself scarce. But once I realized it was happening, it seemed like it would have been a really big deal to say, hey, guys, I'm not comfortable. I know that's an option but it would have stopped the play of all six people most likely. So I'm curious to hear what kind of response you would have to this. Thanks a lot. Yes. I I wanted to, I wanted to dump this question in here because I think it, and actually in so many ways reinforces a lot of what we just talked about around like what to some, some thoughts about going into your first group experience and what that can what that can look like. And I think, first of all, just to, I wanted to celebrate a few things here. One is the realization that you've learned something now that you don't want to do again. And so many people go through these experiences and don't ever take the time to get to that realization or to even think about what, what was happening for me. And so I just, I think that is a really important thing to celebrate that. Yeah. That, we'll just chalk it up to like a bad experience and you did so much more than that. That's cool. Yeah. And, and to the, uh, the, there was a piece in there saying, and this is again, no, no shame on this person. Like these are, these are hard situations to navigate. Right. And I, as you and I were talking before we hit record, like it's, it's hard if you're going to go out to dinner with five friends and they all say they want to go get Mexican and you're like, <laughs> I really wanted pizza tonight. Yeah. Like that can be a hard conversation. Mm-hmm. And so if it's five people who are about to have sex and you're like, oh, I don't know, like yeah. that's a really hard place. But 
you made the comment like, well, if I had known that's what was going to happen, I probably would have made myself scarce mm-hmm. and gone somewhere else. And so, yeah, if everybody else was going to go have Mexican and I went into pizza, if I'd known ahead of time, I would have just like Netflix and chilled. Right. Not that you don't want to eat. Right. Right. You still want to eat. You just don't want that. Exactly. Which is the beauty of the the sort of the share circle that we all sort of just just talked about is but you see everybody walking there and being like, Hey, Hey everybody, can we just talk about what, what everyone's thinking for a second and where yeah. we're at uh-huh. again, that's hard to do. Cause now you're stopping the momentum. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I also see too, the, the, what you kind of shared was it was an impersonal experience that didn't sound like it really worked for anybody. And it broke up rather quickly with everybody going their own way. And so it seems like you weren't the only one who wasn't feeling maybe great about it. And I think that tying into what you said earlier, Miche, about the culture and yeah. Yeah. That we got to change the culture. We got to, well, not change the culture, but we need to make sure that it's a culture we also want to be a part of. And we do that individually, like one person at a time. So being able to say, Hey, like this is sexy. This is hot but I might want to get out of this for a little bit, or I'm overwhelmed right now. And I'm not overwhelmed in a bad way. Like I'm overwhelmed and like, this is just sincerely like overload and it's sexy. I need to breathe for a minute and then come back. Also. Okay. And the people that are playing with you actually want you to have a good time. So if this isn't what that is, I think that most of them would say like, I want you to go be okay. And then if you want to come back, come back. And if not, like that's also okay. Yeah. Well, and, and you're the, 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 the person asking the question is like, super concerned about everybody else's feelings. Yeah. So I loved that part too, because she said, you know, she couldn't have left without hurting everyone's feelings. And what I wanted to say about that was that your feelings matter too. Like your feelings get to be just as important as everyone else's. A thousand percent. And, and again, I just want to keep saying this, that like, it's hard to do. Would it, would it have stopped everybody from playing? Probably, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, And would that have thrown off their vibe? Probably, maybe. And I think there's a part of me that says, good. Yeah. Now they now they will have, if they're like, well, that was really uncomfortable, then they could go back and think, well, what can we do different to make that not uncomfortable for, mm-hmm. well, even if it's initially from a place of why, why that was uncomfortable for me that, that this person interrupted my fun, mm-hmm. what do I need to do different? Oh, shit, maybe I could have better conversations before we all jump on the bed. Yeah. That's that's how we change the culture. Or now they know like what a no looks like, right? Yep. If I do a no well, mm-hmm. now someone else knows what that's like. And then they might have more confidence next time if they're in a situation they don't want to be in either to also say no. Yeah. And the permission to like a beautifully polished no is a wonderful thing. And if you need to get out of somewhere, simply saying no, nope. I'm out. Uh-huh. That's that's just as valid and beautiful as Absolutely. as the as a shit sandwich. Just uh-huh. to, just to, throw that out there. Just throw the nope, not doing it, and get out. So, <laughs> yeah. But for all of you recovering people pleasers, okay, yeah. <laughs> pot calling the kettle black here. I need a shit sandwich. I've got a form it in my head. It needs to happen. And also, sometimes saying no with a gentle hand on the shoulder is like the most bold thing you can do, and that's also okay. Yeah. I totally, totally. I, I think too, just like try again, it's, it sucks and it's hard to be the person where it lands on your shoulders to say, I, I can start to change the culture of this environment by doing it different and it's hard mm-hmm. and, and maybe it doesn't change. And then maybe you go, well, that's not my place anymore. Cause I keep finding myself in situations that are uncomfortable yeah. and not being respected. Absolutely. So it's really important to be able to know that you can change your mind. You can be in the middle of something and choose no, especially for a lot of people, they go into a situation. It's like, this is, this is a maybe it's not a full yes. And so being Mm -hmm. able to hear yourself in the situation, because we're pushing, right? Sometimes we're challenging our boundaries. Sometimes we're trying something new and you can do all of those things in this space as well. Um, and you're allowed to say, Oh, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm not, not really feeling this and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if even better, if you can communicate that up front, like, Hey, I'm, I want to try this, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. I'm nervous and this and this and this, now that person can look out. Now you're looking out for each other in that space. Oh, that's great. And then the people who are playing with you get to trust your no Mm -hmm. and your guests, right? Like if I can trust that your no 
you're able to say your say no, then I can also trust your yes. And then the boundaries really are the boundaries. It, it lets other people feel safe to play because they know that you can speak up for yourself. And that's a beautiful thing. That's trust as well. I love that. Yeah. And I think the last, the last point I wanted to make about to tie this and advice to go into a group sex environment is to have fun that like, that's kind of why we're there. That's why we're there. And, and if you can manage to do even some of these things we've talked about, it can make that experience a whole hell of a lot of fun. I love an enthusiastic guest. Yeah. yeah. I will say, even when I'm the person who ends up eating cookies in the kitchen by myself, <laughs> I was having a good time because I understood the dynamics of the entire situation. Uh-huh. People understood mine yeah. and I was totally good being where I was at. That sounds like safety. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like yeah. that. Amazing. Well, how do you feel about that one? How? Do, well, I know this is a little unusual ways to wrap up questions, but this is our first time. This is our, this first, is our time first time doing this. This is yeah. unrehearsed. So how do you feel about it? I think it went pretty well. Um, I enjoyed the questions. I enjoyed being able to sit and just kind of stew th- through it and then, then be able to say whatever just comes off my head. Mm-hmm. Um, about about the questions. Also trying to put myself in the person's shoes a little bit and just be like, hmm, what does this feel like? So that's been nice. I hope the feedback was helpful as well. Yeah. No, I'm, I feel really great about this and I'm excited. I think to, as we continue doing these and this is, uh, you know, to, to anybody listening, we're, our goal is to keep these to around a half hour. This first one got a little long because um, we were introducing ourselves and wanted to give you a little more of a flavor of what this looks like. But our goal is about a half hour. And that might be one mm-hmm. question. It might be two. Who knows? They might be 10 really short ones. But um, we Good just, fires. yeah, we're, uh, we're excited to keep doing these. And so, yeah, we would love for everybody listening again, send us some feedback, uh, send us questions. We need questions. We will be putting these out every fourth Friday okay. of each month. And so awesome. this one, uh, we'll, we'll have another one out in a month from now. Yeah. This is so much fun. I'm excited to be here and to share this time with everyone and to answer these awesome questions. I may not always have the best answers, but we can stew through them together. Yeah. Hey, there's, there's usually no perfectly right answer. And I'm, I'm learning this now yes. after 36 years of existing that, that sometimes it's not perfect. It's not perfect. Just like e and We've never been here before. We're going to figure it out, though. Right. And so really quick, Misha, for anybody who wants to find you, reach out to you, work with you, or get more from you, how do people best do that? Um, you can go to our website, which is expansiveconnection.com. Um, you are also more than welcome to email me. Um, it's just Misha, M-E-S-H-A-I, at expansiveconnection.com. Real simple. Perfect. And links to everything Misha just said will be in the show notes so you don't have to memorize it all or pull your car over to write it down. Don't do that. And we will see everybody in a month. And Emma and I will see you next Wednesday for our regularly scheduled interview. And yeah, again, Misha and I will be back in a month. Awesome. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.